Hi everyone, uh, my name is Stephen Hollis. I'm an intellectual property attorney with Adams and Adams Law Firm. And uh, thank you for coming out in a, on a cold and crisp Johannesburg morning. And uh, today we're going to talk about something that's extremely important for anyone interested in making a success of their business. Intellectual property, such a, such a hefty word, isn't it? And uh, in the end, any business, every business today depends on intellectual property, the protection thereof, the development thereof, and the enforcement thereof to make a success of your business. There's no business today that can make a success of themselves if they do not look after their intellectual property assets. Now, interestingly enough, uh, about 20, 30 years ago, if you looked at the, the sort of the, the, the books of, the, of, of companies, intellectual property assets didn't really feature at all. You, companies used to list their physical assets, their buildings, their trucks, their, uh, their physical assets, but little mention would be made on the balance sheet of intellectual property assets. And that situation has changed dramatically. Now if you look at a listing of a company's assets, the intellectual property assets, more often than not, is listed as the most valuable assets of that business. Now, Tony Robbins, you all know Tony Robbins, the, uh, he, he, he hates to be referred to as a motivational speaker or a life coach, but he's a lot of things. He's got about 27 companies, he's very successful. Tony will tell you, he often says so, that when every business person should at all times be managing two businesses, namely the business that you are currently in and the business that you are becoming. If you only focus on the business that you are currently in, you'll find that your competitors, a competitor will start innovating and actually overtake you. But if you only focus on the business that you want to be one day, you might find that you actually overextend, you might invest too much, and you might find yourself having some cash flow problems. Now, how do you manage this balance that Tony speaks about? One of the answers is actually to manage your intellectual property assets, and we're going to speak about that a bit more. So if you look after your IP assets, if you identify your intellectual property assets, if you recognize the value thereof, and if you understand the importance thereof to your business, then you're already taking part of step one, the now. And the manner in which you then protect your intellectual property and use it to your advantage to establish a commercial edge over your competitors. Because that's really what IP is. Intellectual property is a statutory right that you have to exclusively make use of a certain asset, whether it's a brand, whether it's a, an invention, whether it's a, a design of a product, or whether it's an item in which you own the copyright, you've got the exclusive right to use it. What does that mean for you as a business person? It means that your competitors can't use it. So it's a, it's a commercial advantage, right? That's why it's so important, and we're going to delve into that a bit deeper. But before we, we jump into the, the uh, the discussion on IP, let's sort of look at a practical example of a business that started not so long ago and who is now recognized as a mega, mega brand. You all know Airbnb, right? Have you, have you used Airbnb? Who here have used Airbnb? Not yet. Yes, you have. Okay, thanks. Now, Joe Gebbia, it's quite interesting how it started. It started most, uh, a lot of businesses uh, that has, um, uh, uh, well, this business started with fixing a problem in the market. Now, the problem in this market for Joe was he was sort of fresh out of university, and him and his roommates, the, their rent was sort of moved up 
by something like 20 or 25 percent. And they couldn't afford their nice apartment anymore in uh, uh, San Francisco. And they thought, what are we going to do? We're going to lose our apartment. And it's a lovely apartment. We don't want to lose this place. So they saw there was like a conference in San Francisco, like a massive conference, a design conference. And they posted on that website to say, we've actually got a room because there's thousands of people coming to San Francisco. There's not enough accommodation. We've got a lovely room. Why don't you come and stay with us and we'll even introduce you a little bit to our friends and take you around the city, you know, if you have spare time. So they rented out their room. They made enough money that month to actually pay their, their rent, right? Then they realized there's a business concept here. Now, Airbnb was not an overnight success. These guys relaunched many times because they couldn't establish user trust in a system. The first time I heard of Airbnb, a friend of mine was going to New York and I, and she, and I said, what are you doing? She's like, I'm on this website and I'm going to stay on, on someone's couch in New York. And I'm like, are you crazy? How do you know this person? I mean, this could be like a serial killer or something, you know? How do you trust this system? And that's what Airbnb struggled for a long time. How to establish user consumer trust in their brand. But once you do that, you can start building your business exponentially. Now, funny enough, Airbnb actually means air bed and breakfast. Eh? So that's, that's what they started off as. They, the person who came to sleep in their, in their apartment actually slept on an air bed, like one of those mattresses that you buy and you, you inflate with the air. That's where Airbnb comes from. Now, what they did to actually establish uh, user trust, it took them a long time. They, they, they really struggled to figure out how to get consumers to trust their brand. So that when you actually go onto the website, or when you have the app on your phone, when you recognize that brand that you trust, that if you access this system and you book accommodation, your needs will be met, your expectations will be met. And in many ways, the design of their website was key. The colors that they chose. These guys were design experts. That's what they did at university as well. So the colors that they chose, the layout of the website, the manner in which the reviews are written, they guided that whole process. And in the end, they established a system in which people actually have trust. You feel almost like a friendly vibe if you go onto the website. Now, if you think about it, how do you design a client experience? And believe me when I say to you, the big companies know how to do this. Coca-Cola, if you open that can of Coke, that sound, psh, even on their, on their advertisements, especially the older ones, you remember that distinct psh. It's what experience do you get? It's not just buying a product, taking it off the shelf, and consuming it. The big companies know Airbnb included, you have to give your consumer an experience from beginning to end. Companies are even now going further and saying, you know, if you see a product on the shelf, what is the consumer, the purchaser's first experience? What is their feeling when they see your brand? How do they react to it when they, they open it or they take that first sip? What is the design of your bottle? What does that do for you as a consumer? Consumers nowadays are quite environmentally conscious as well. So a lot of companies are thinking of ways to even treat the recycling of the product so that the consumer feels that they're contributing to the environment by choosing this product. So it's about designing a consumer experience to set yourself apart. Now, Joe Gebbia of Airbnb says it's more important to find a hundred people that love your brand than it is to get a million people who like it. <coughs> and at some stage when they actually, uh, in New York, they didn't have any advertising at all. They didn't have budget. So what do you do? Word of mouth is a powerful thing because 
if you have a positive consumer experience, you will share that experience with your friends, with your colleagues, with your family. And that's how a business can grow. Airbnb grew like that. At some stage, they didn't even have, they realized that they needed to take better quality photographs of the apartments and the homes and so forth. And uh, Joe Gebbia went himself, the business owner, and, and knocked on people's doors who wanted to advertise on Airbnb and said, look, I'm bringing a professional photographer with me. Do you mind if we take photos of your apartment because we think we can do a better job of selling it for you? What experience does that give to you as a person who wants to let a, an apartment space, for instance? The owner of the company is here to help you. That personal touch helped them grow and the word of mouth, especially in New York, established them. That's the first place that they were established and it's pretty much due to that word of mouth marketing. Incredible, isn't it? And that's how it can spread like a wildfire. But in the end, and we will, um, you know, if you think about Airbnb, what, what, is, what is the value? Where is the value of that business? And I'm going to just let you think about that for a moment. And I'm going to ask one of our audience members, no one is safe, to tell me in a few moments, think about it. What is the value of Airbnb? Where is the value in that business, okay? Now, maybe I'm giving some of the answers away here with all this stuff on the, on the slides. By the way, the slides will be made available to all of you. You can download it from the website or um, uh, there will be a recording as well. So, I guess the value of IP to every business um, is quite well summed up by the CEO of Coca-Cola many years ago, not that many, maybe about six years ago, said, you can destroy my entire business you can take away all my physical assets as long as you leave me my intellectual property rights intact. I will rebuild this business from the ground up within one year. You can take all my physical assets away. You can take all my products from the shelves worldwide. You leave my IP and I build it back up in one year. See how important and valuable your IP is? Think of that statement for a moment. The most valuable asset for Coca-Cola. Now, IP assets, as we discussed, give you a business edge, a competitive advantage. It allows you, if you protect and commercialize your IP assets effectively, to achieve significant and unbelievable growth because it gives you an advantage that your competitors are not allowed to encroach upon, okay? Now, I've got a few examples of you of some large companies that started somewhere. Now, these guys knew how to protect their brands, they knew how to promote and market their brands, and they knew how to, that once consumers buy into it, The sky is truly the limit. Mars is the limit. Jeff Bezos founded Amazon as an online bookstore in 1994, run out of his garage. And he sold his first book in July 1995. Today, it's the biggest retailer in the world. It's not a long time ago, if you think about it, 95, to overtake everyone, okay? Apple, we know their story. These guys, uh, Steve Jobs um, and his partner built, hand built 50 computers in 30 days in a garage in California. And today they're the most valuable technology company around. Walt Disney, they started to uh, make movies. I think the Alice in Wonderland movies was made in a garage as well. The first one. Today it's the highest grossing media conglomerate. Uh, Facebook. Sorry, Google. Google first. I uh, don't know if you guys know the story of this one, but uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin started Google also from a garage. These things start from garages, eh? Low overheads to begin. 
Um, and it was offered to them uh, to, to purchase Google for like a million dollars and they said, actually, at that stage, they thought about selling the, the business because it was interfering with their studies. And can you believe where they are now? Um, Holly Davidson, these guys started building like electrical motor bikes in, uh, also from a wooden shed and today the most well-known motorcycle brand in the world. Now, we'll get to, back to these guys in a moment. What's the value in a brand and what IP is in your business? It's very important for you as a business person to understand how to identify the IP assets in your business. Because if you can't identify the IP assets in your business, and if you as a business person at the moment, you're sitting here and you're thinking, I wonder what are my IP assets? Then it's time that you think about it hard and make a clear determination. And if necessary, go and see an intellectual property attorney to say, let's look at this. Let's look at how I can ring fence my IP, control my IP assets, and actually either license it out or understand the rights that I'm licensing in as a franchisee of a franchise system, for instance. Now, as discussed previously, IP rights form these statutory monopolies. Now, all that lofty word means is it's actually a monopoly that the law grants you. Now, there's various pieces of legislation. There's a Trademarks Act, so if you register your trademarks, in terms of the Trademarks Act, the Act says you're the only one that can make use of this brand in respect of certain goods and services, okay? And if somebody else encroaches on that, you can throw the letter of the law at them. You can raise to the judge a copy of your trademark registration certificate. Let's say your trademark, the Daily Coffee Cafe, in respect of beverages and in respect of certain foodstuffs. If somebody uses that brand or something very similar there too, you raise your, your registration certificate and that gives you a clear right. You can get an interdict on that basis and pull someone else's products from the market. These are powerful, powerful tools to protect your business interests. Intellectual property, we're just gonna quickly do a definition. Uh, don't worry, most IP lawyers struggle to get tongue-tied when asked to try a definition of IP. But if you think about it, it's like, it's quite simple. It's, 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 um, it's creations of the, 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 the human mind, right? Certain creations of the human mind to which uh, material expression, which are materially expressed. There's no protection in an idea. So let's say we sit on a train together on the Gau train, we're traveling to Pretoria. By the time we get to Pretoria, you've told me your great idea for a new game show. I, I'm listening to you, and uh, by the time we get off the train, we say our goodbyes, and a few months later, you see, hey, there's my game show concept. It's on TV. Everything that I said, the way that the program was set up, <laughs> What am I going to do now? Well, there's nothing you can do because there's no protection in an idea. There's only protection in material expressions of ideas. Patents can sometimes give you protection in a concept. That's true. You've got an invention. But generally speaking, you've got to do something with your idea. So if you've got an idea for a brand or, or an idea for, for let's say, uh, a, a copyright protected in material form somehow before the law, may grant you protection. So let's have a quick look at this to test your knowledge on IP. Uh, who here wants to shout out? What do you see there? What is the protectable IP in that depiction? Yes? The words Coca-Cola. The words Coca-Cola, correct. That's a brand yeah, the that they registered it. So just the words or what else? Sorry? Yes, the, the stylization, the exactly. Bottle, the bottle itself? The bottle itself, absolutely. So the bottle, the, the name and the stylization is protected through trademark registration process. The bottle, if it's an unusual shape, can be protected by a design registration. But interestingly enough, also as a trademark. If you educate your consumers that your bottle shape is also an origin indicator, but you've got to establish a reputation in it, all right? It's interesting if you see how Coca-Cola, how smart they are 
with the way that they use their brands. On their cans, you'll see that they've got the outline of the bottle shape and a little R next to it, or a TM. So that when you buy the can, subconsciously or, or even consciously, you see that little bowl shape and you associate it with Coca-Cola. It's quite difficult to register a shape because it, it pre prevents your competitors from, from doing something similar. But if you do it smart enough, and if you've got an original and a distinctive shape for a product, you can actually protect it like that. What else? Is there anything else that Coca-Cola has an IP right in? Yes? Say again? The color red, absolutely. The color red, the colors can be regist registrable as trademarks too. If you've established that consumer knowledge in that, the reputation. What else? The drink, yes. Merchandise 7X. No one knows what it is. Well, they know sort of what it is. It's like some, I guess, corn syrup in there, and extract, and uh, some sugar, and all sorts of stuff. But um, no one has been able to reverse engineer this drink. Everyone's been trying. The competitors have been trying, but the actual recipe is locked somewhere in Atlanta, at the world of Coca-Cola, in a, in a safe that only two people are rumored to have the, uh, the, the current combination to, and, uh, but the, it, it takes a special resolution of the board to open that safe. Now, that's a trade secret. If you have a trade secret, it's also a form of intellectual property. So you've got things like trademarks and copyright and designs, but you also have your confidential information and your trade secrets are also intellectual property assets.